My name is Nick Johnston, and today I want to tell you the story of the catastrophic flood that destroyed Johnstown, Pennsylvania in 1889. At the time, it was the worst disaster the United States had ever seen, and it still stands as the worst dam break in U.S. history. So, let's dig in. First, I want to outline what will be covered today. Number one, an overview of the disaster. Number two, how did this happen? Number three, photos of the destruction. Number four, stories from survivors. And number five, blame and legal outcomes. So what exactly happened in Johnstown more than 130 years ago? Well, at around 3 p.m., on the afternoon of May 31, 1889, after a night of torrential rains, the South Fork Dam, 72 feet high and three football fields wide, collapsed, sending 3.8 billion, with a B, gallons of water crashing down the narrow Connemaw Valley. To give that perspective, that's roughly the amount of water that flows over Niagara Falls in 36 minutes. It took approximately 50 minutes for the flood wave to plow the 14 miles down the Little Connemaw River Valley to the bustling city of Johnstown, Pennsylvania. When it arrived, it was 35 to 40 feet high. Along the way, the floodwaters wiped out whole communities, a railroad yard, a barbed wire factory, an oil refinery, which meant that the flood wave not only included barbed wire, locomotives, trees, houses, horses, and anything else in its path, but it was also on fire. When it reached Johnstown, the result was described as hell on earth. Rather than simply drowning, many people were crushed to death and never found, as the leading edge of the flood wave was rolling. Many others who somehow survived the initial onslaught burned to death in the backup of debris at the stone bridge at the far end of Johnstown, as depicted in this artist's rendering. At the time, it was the worst disaster in U.S. history. 2,209 people confirmed dead and several hundred to nearly a thousand people missing and presumed dead. 1,600 homes were obliterated along with 99 entire families including 396 children. So the looming question, how did this happen? Well, there are six main causes that came together to create this catastrophe. Take out any one of these and the devastation could have been greatly reduced or in some cases even avoided. First, the structure of the dam. Second, lack of maintenance. Third, excessive rainfall. Fourth, deforestation of the surrounding hills. Fifth, the FAR, or false alarm rate. And sixth, the local topography. I'm going to go through and explain each of these factors, but before I do, let's get our bearings. Let's start with a map of Johnstown, Pennsylvania in 1889. On the far right side of your screen is Lake Connemaw and the South Fork Dam. Heading past the dam, down the Little Connemaw River, you travel about 14 miles until you reach the city of Johnstown. Note that the Connemaw River runs right through the middle of town. And on the far end of town is the infamous Stone Bridge, where so many Johnstown residents who survived the initial flood wave met their demise by fire. This is a more modern look at roughly the same area, courtesy of Google Maps. The area, outlined in red, indicates the city of Johnstown. Notice the blue dot on the far right side of your screen. That represents the Johnstown Flood National Memorial. Finally, here's a wider view of the map to give you a better perspective. Johnstown, indicated by the red dot, is located about 70 miles east of Pittsburgh and about 200 miles west of Philadelphia in the front section of the Allegheny Mountains. Now, there are a few key players that you need to meet. I need to introduce the South Fork Fishing and Hunting Club, located on Lake Connemaw, a man-made lake at the top of the Connemaw River Valley. Much of the blame for the death and destruction in Johnstown would ultimately fall to the owners of the South Fork Fishing and Hunting Club. The South Fork Fishing and Hunting Club was a popular retreat for wealthy industrialists looking to escape Pittsburgh's smoke-filled skies. 
By 1889, more than a dozen cottages surrounded the three-story clubhouse. It was very much a well-to-do country club of its day. Members of the club included Andrew Carnegie of Carnegie Steel, at one point the richest man in America, Henry Frick, industrialist, union buster, and art patron, and Andrew Mellon, banker, businessman, and politician, among many others. As you will come to find out, there are good reasons that the press and the public came to point a finger at the South Fork Fishing and Hunting Club and its members, although, as you will come to find out, not all of the blame is deserved. Now let's get back to the causes of how exactly this happened. Well, the first cause, the structure of the dam. Limitations of construction materials, tools, and engineering know-how meant that most dams of the 1800s were earth dams, or embankment dams. Many were made with a wooden core, then filled with a combination of large and small rocks, silt, and clay. This type of dam can be semi-permanent. But if overtopping or overflow occurs where water flows over the top of the dam, failure is nearly certain. This was the type of dam used to block the Connemaw River and form Lake Connemaw. Reason number two, a lack of maintenance. There are three parts to this problem. The first part, a previous owner removed the drainage pipes beneath the dam to sell them for scrap metal, which meant there was no way to drain the reservoir for repairs or relieve any pressure. When the South Fork Fishing and Hunting Club purchased the dam in 1879, that's 10 years before the disaster, the club never reinstalled the drainage pipes. Reason number two. The South Fork Fishing and Hunting Club installed fish screens across the dam's spillway to keep the expensive game fish that they had stocked the lake with from escaping. Anyone want to venture a guess as to why that could be a problem? It had the unfortunate effect of capturing debris and clogging the spillway, preventing it from doing its job and draining the lake's overflow. And third, the club also lowered the dam by several feet in order to make the road that crossed it wide enough for two carriages to pass at the same time instead of one. So the top of the dam was only about four feet higher than the top of the spillway. Not a lot of wiggle room. Reason number three, excessive rainfall. Although no official rainfall measurements were taken at the time, a caretaker at the South Fork Fishing and Hunting Club reported eight inches of rainfall in a bucket in under 24 hours. If that's hard to picture, we do have a recent reminder, Tropical Storm Irene. On August 29, 2011, Tropical Storm Irene dumped between eight to as much as 12 inches of rain on New York and Vermont. In Vermont alone, more than 2,400 roads, 800 homes and businesses, and 300 bridges, including many of their historic covered bridges, were destroyed. And that's with modern engineering. Number four, deforestation. Due to a rapid buildup of Johnstown and the communities that lined the valley, as well as industrial activity, the surrounding forests had largely been stripped of their trees. This is confirmed through historical photographs and documented eyewitness accounts. This deforestation led to a significant rise in the amount of runoff and the amount of debris that washed into the reservoir. In fact, one study showed that had there been better vegetative cover on the surrounding hills, water may have never topped the dam, making its failure unlikely. Reason number five, FAR, the false alarm rate. Due to frequent flooding of the Little Connemaw River and numerous rumors of dam failure in the past, the residents of Johnstown had become numb to the very real threat that loomed upriver. So much so that when the dispatch office in Johnstown received a telegraph more than two hours before the dam broke that read, quote, South Fork Dam is liable to break. Stop. Notify the people of Johnstown to prepare for the worst. Stop. The telegraph officer in charge glanced at the message, then ignored it. And when his assistant showed the message to two local men passing by, 
they proceeded to read the telegraph, then laugh out loud. Needless to say, no one heeded the warning. Number six, topography. The steep walls of the Connemaw River Valley and lack of outlets contributed to making a bad situation much worse. This had a funneling effect on the floodwaters, which basically had nowhere to go. At times in the valley, the advancing floodwaters measured 89 feet above the riverbed, and the flood wave was still 35 to 40 feet high, moving at an average speed of 40 miles per hour when it reached Johnstown. Okay, now we've covered the six major causes for this catastrophe. Next, I want to show you what it actually looked like. If a picture's worth a thousand words, then strap in. I'm about to unleash a torrent of imagery. Okay, first up is a view from the top of what once was the South Fork Dam. Notice the pilings on the right side of the image that used to be the core of the dam. Here's a view from the surrounding hills of the debris, and uh, in the far distance there, that's the stone bridge that caused the big backup of debris. Here's another view of the general ruins of Johnstown, and I feel like a lot of these next few photos are sort of self-explanatory, so I'm just going to let them run by themselves. I did want you to notice something uh, in this photo that stood out to me. Uh, in a lot of these photos, you'll see people posing for pictures. At the very bottom of the screen, there's a woman wearing a bonnet uh, with her head in her hands. I think that about says it all. Now here's a much closer view of that stone bridge and the backup of debris. Uh, the important thing to take away here is that during the height of the flood, all of that debris was on fire. And here's another close-up view of the stone bridge and the pile of smoldering debris that was burning at the time of the flood. A few soldiers overlooking the aftermath of the flood from a nearby hilltop. So here's an aspect you might not have thought of. This is a man and his two sons that have set up a shop selling souvenirs that were found in the flood to the tourists who showed up in Johnstown in the days afterwards. And here's a very different view of family life. This family living in a hastily built shanty out of debris, again, found in the aftermath of the flood.
Now here's a shot of the destruction from a distance. But if you're ready for some good news, take a look at all those little white tents. The International Red Cross had only been founded eight years prior, in 1881, primarily as a battlefield relief organization. Clara Barton, the founder, had led some battlefield relief efforts during the Civil War. However, Barton felt the Red Cross could also provide relief for peacetime disasters, and the Johnstown flood of 1889 provided the first real opportunity. Barton, now 67 years old, and to give that perspective, the average life expectancy for women at the time was 45. Well, Clara Barton and 50 volunteers arrived from Washington, D.C. just five days after the flood. Thanks in part to sensational newspaper reporting, money and supplies poured into Johnstown. Under Clara Barton's direction, the American Red Cross distributed new and used supplies valued at $211,000, and some 25,000 people were helped. Ultimately, 3 million... $742,818.78 was collected for the Johnstown relief effort from within the U.S. and 18 foreign countries. Barton stayed in Johnstown until October 24, 1889, and the grateful people of Johnstown gave her a gold pin and a locket set in diamonds and amethysts as a farewell present. And the pay-it-back spirit continued. In 1892, three years later, the people of Johnstown sent $2,596 to Barton to help with her efforts to relieve the famine in Russia. All right. Photographs of the aftermath can really help you picture what happened, but nothing beats survivor accounts for putting you in the moment. That might not be a good thing. I've got to warn you, some of the stories you're about to hear are rough, so bear with me if I have to pause. These are emotional, gut-wrenching stories. The Tragedy of Mrs. Anna Fenn When the flood wave reached the city, the residents had precious few seconds to either prepare themselves for death or miraculously avoid it. Mrs. Anna Fenn, who was pregnant with her eighth child, was in her home on Locust Street while her husband, John, was at a neighbor's house helping them move furniture to higher ground. There had already been minor flooding in the streets of Johnstown for most of the day, which again was all too common. When shouts of panic began to ring out, she watched her husband get swept away as he ran for their front steps. But the horror that followed was far worse. Trapped in their now floating home, Mrs. Fenn held their youngest child, a baby, while the other six children clung to her, but one by one she watched as all seven children drowned. She describes the scene as follows, quote, The water rose and floated us until our heads nearly touched the ceiling. It was dark, and the house was tossing every way. The air was stifling, and I could not tell just the moment the rest of the children had to give up and drowned. What I suffered with the bodies of my seven children floating around me in the gloom can never be told. Mrs. Fenn would eventually be pulled to safety after a wild three-mile ride on top of a tar barrel. But upon being rescued, she wailed, quote, my God, what have I to live for, end quote. A few weeks after the flood, Mrs. Fenn gave birth to a beautiful baby girl but that child would also die. She would later remarry and move to Virginia. The Story of Rose and Sons One of the first in the city to see the approaching flood wave was a lawyer named Horace Rose, who happened to be home at the time. Some shouts from outside and the sound of a wildly clanging bell convinced him to go to the window to take a look. What he saw took his breath away. From his third-story window, he could see nearly a mile up the valley. On this day, he saw the wall of water and debris stretched from one end of the valley to the other, moving at about 40 miles per hour. 
He watched the wave slice through the Gautier Works factory that produced barbed wire, which caused explosions and sent up a cloud of fire, soot, and steam. I saw, quote, a great mass of timber, trees, roofs, and debris of every sort rapidly advancing toward me, wrecking and carrying everything before it, end quote. It was at this moment that one of his sons, who had joined him at the window, looked up and asked, quote, can't we escape? To which Mr. Rose replied as gently as he could, quote, no, this means death to us all, end quote. But astonishingly, it did not. Crippled instantly as the torrent slammed his house, Mr. Rose was somehow able to haul himself onto the floating roof of their now smashed home, but had to watch helplessly as his family floundered in the swirling water. One of his sons managed to climb onto the roof as well, and then incredibly a man swimming by was able to help Rose's wife and daughter onto the same fragment of their home. Remarkably, Mr. Rose's other three sons also survived the flood and would later be reunited as a family. Little Gertrude Slattery Six-year-old Gertrude Quinn Slattery was one of those caught in the flood wave, but was fortunate enough to climb on top of what she describes as a raft with a wet, muddy mattress and bedding. She goes on to describe her ordeal. Quote, I had great faith that I would not be abandoned, she said. While my thoughts were thus engaged, a large roof came floating toward me with about 20 people on it. I cried and called across the water to them to help me. This, of course, they could not do. The roof was big, and they were all holding on for dear life, feeling every minute that they would be tossed to death. While I watched, I kept praying, calling, and begging someone to save me. Then I saw a man come to the edge, the others holding him and talking excitedly. I could see they were trying to restrain him, but he kept pulling to get away, which he finally did, and plunged into the swirling waters and disappeared. Then his head appeared, and I could see he was looking in my direction, and I called, cried, and begged him to come to me. He kept going down and coming up, sometimes lost to my sight entirely, only to come up next time much closer to my raft. As I sat watching this man struggling in the water, my mind was firmly fixed on the fact that he was my savior. At last he reached me, drew himself up and over the edge of the mattress, and lifted me up. I put both arms around his neck and held on to him like grim death. Together we went downstream with the ebb and flow of the reflex to the accompaniment of crunching, grinding, gurgling, splashing, crying, and moaning of many. After drifting about, we saw a little white building standing at the edge of the water, apparently where the hill began. At the window were two men with poles, helping to rescue people floating by. I was too far out for the poles. So the men cried, throw that baby over here to us. My hero said, do you think you can catch her? They said, we can try. So Maxwell McCochran, who was described as a surly factory worker, threw me across the water. Some say 20 feet, others 15. I could never find out, so I leave it to your imagination. It was considered a great feat in the town, I know." End quote. The men did manage to catch Gertrude, but Maxwell continued down the river amid the debris and fire. Four miles he rode the floodwaters until a group of men with ropes managed to reel his makeshift raft to shore. Gertrude never saw McCochran again to thank him, but some 40 years after the flood, she read about his obituary in the Johnstown Tribune and brought roses to his grave. She would also go on to write a book of her experience. Whew. Wow. Now let's talk about the aftermath. Given the nearly unimaginable horrors of what happened, you can probably understand why much of the blame landed on the shoulders of the members of the South Fork Fishing and Hunting Club in the days and weeks that followed. This was perhaps best summed up in a poem written by Isaac Reed at the time. Many thousand human lives butchered husbands, slaughtered wives, 
mangled daughters, bleeding sons, hosts of martyred little ones, worse than Herod's awful crime, sent to heaven before their time, lovers burned and sweethearts drowned, darlings lost but never found, all the horrors that hell could wish, such was the price that was paid for fish. Ouch. Despite widespread blame and outcry from both the press and public, survivors were never able to recover damages in court, and the members of the club never faced any charges. The club was successfully defended by the firm of Knox and Reed, whose partners, Philander Knox and James Reed, were, say it with me, members of the club. The court ultimately held that the dam break was an act of God and granted the survivors no legal compensation. However, it is important to note, individual members of the club did contribute significantly to the recovery. Along with about half of the club members, Henry Clay Frick donated thousands of dollars to the relief effort. Andrew Carnegie donated 10000 which today would be worth about $275,000, and built the town a new library. As you might imagine, many were not satisfied with the court's decision. As a result of the widespread national criticism in the 1890s, state courts around the country adopted Rylands v. Fletcher, a British common law precedent. That decision held that a non-negligent defendant could be held liable for damage caused by the unnatural use of land, like building a dam, which would ultimately lead in the 1900s to the development and acceptance of strict liability law, which holds owners responsible for damages. Johnstown Today The Carnegie Library is now owned by the Johnstown Historical Society, which has adapted it for use as the Johnstown Flood Museum. At Point Park in Johnstown, at the confluence of the Stony Creek and the Little Connemaw Rivers, an eternal flame burns in memory of the flood victims.